you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, this is Foss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show. We've got the cracking voice there. What's going on? Uh, clearly, my uh, going to have to go back to my opera teacher and get some work done on that. Anyway, guys, as always, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives, because if you haven't, you're not honoring your downline and your obligations to the Chris Foss Show. You need to be inviting at least five of your friends relatives and neighbors to uh subscribe no i'm just kidding you don't have to do that you can just enjoy the show seriously people it's a joke but it is a way to segue into the plugs the plugs as we like to call them the uh youtube.com for just chris voss goodreads.com for just chris voss and linkedin.com chris voss repeat after me uh tell people to subscribe to the show give us five stars over there on itunes uh and we love you uh is that enough begging and grifting and whatever else i can do on the show there you go there's the plugs anyway guys we have an amazing author on the show i'm excited to talk to him about his book because his book is a journey that i think a lot of us go on in our lives where we kind of reach a point uh and i think it comes from in, in maturity too um where we start to uh, reckon you know who we are where have we been? Where do we come from? Who are the people in our lives? And what are the indelible imprints that they've left on our souls, on our making, our creation? You know, we start to really kind of ponder that, why are we here? And who the hell were those people that got us here? And so uh, I think uh, this will be a great discussion. Um, he is the author of the newest book that came out February 21st, 2023. Emmanuel Aduma is on the show with us today. His book is called I Am Still With You, A Reckoning with Silence, Inheritance, in history and uh, he talks about his journey of going back uh and trying to find his past and uh what goes what what went into his past and how he got there he was born in nigeria in 1989 aduma studied law at oau in uh nigeria and he received his mfa in art criticism and writing from the school of visual arts new york USA. He's the author of the travelogue, uh, Strangers Pose 2018, which was long listed for the 2019 prize. His uh, nonfiction and criticism have appeared in Aperture Art in America, Art Forum, Granta, N Plus One, The New York Review of Books, The L Review, and other publications. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing very well. It's nice to be here, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the show. We really appreciate it, Emmanuel. Uh, give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Um, my, my website is emmanueliduma.com, and you can go there and have access to a lot of the work that I've done. There you go. And you, I, how many books have you written so far? Um, so this is the third book that I've written. Um, mm -hmm. The first was a novel that was published um, many years ago in Nigeria, and then the second um is a stranger's pose and this is the third book that i'm read i've written yeah there you go so what motivated you want to write this book um many things and um on many levels the first level was that i've always been you know of course fascinated by the Ni nigerian history um partly because you know growing up it wasn't very available in a sense in my curriculum and so once i became conscious that i wanted to be a writer i also became equally conscious that i needed to think through um you know the histories that had shaped me in some way and the nigerian civil war um, also known as the biafran war is certainly perhaps the biggest event in nigeria's um, post-colonial history um, and that was always fascinating to me for many reasons, but I think more consequentially was the fact that my uncle um, or one of my uncles who I was named after went to fight in the war on the Biafran side and did not come back. And no one sort of knew what happened to him after the war ended. 
and, and people began to return home. And so I, I knew that in some way I wanted to write about who he was. Um, I, I mean, I didn't know how to do that until, um, you know, my father passed and I felt, oh, you know, this is the perfect moment. Well, an imperfect moment, so to speak, to mm -hmm. begin that journey, because I, I also wanted to deal with um, my father's life, but to sort of deal with it through um, my uncle's life, so to speak. Yeah. There you go. And and I think this is a moment, I assume it's a moment uh, many people go through in their lives. It happened to me and happened to you and, and other things where we we kind of start to reflect on things. We kind of wonder like, you know, there, there's a time where I think we take maybe our parents for granted and the relatives mm -hmm. in our lives. And then there's a time where they start to disappear or they start disappearing yeah. and we start to going you know who formed me why did they mm -hmm. form me why were they motivated by what they did what was their journeys and that's the beauty of what, what i love about the show is we get to talk about other people's journeys because mine's boring as hell <laughs> um and i'm sick of it so um i, I imagine you you kind of went through the same sort of cathartic moment uh especially after the loss of your father of wondering who am i and what got me here and and who are these other people yeah I, i'm i completely agree with that assessment i think as someone said i can't remember who exactly that we we lose our childhoods twice the first time when we grow up and become adults and the second time when our parents die wow and and i you know and it's such a powerful concept um because you know for people whose parents live until, you know, say they are 90, you could say, oh, they had a very long childhood. Um, or, um, But for me, you know, both my parents um, passed by the time I was 30, you know, it's a relatively short, quote unquote, childhood. Mm -hmm. But that's besides the point, or that's in addition to the fact that for me, um, thinking about, as I said, my father's life, um, or trying to make sense of it really, um, really was what drove me to reflecting on other lives in my family, um, such as my uncle. And I, I feel I feel like this is an important um, place to make the point that for me, as I imagine for many people, you know, you don't really get a lot. <laughs> Right. Um, mm -hmm. You don't get a resolution, even if you had reams of documents that even if your parents say wrote a memoir. Right. Mm -hmm. You you don't necessarily have access to every single thing that might be noteworthy to you, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and so the question then becomes, what do you deal with? How do you deal rather with um, the limits of what you know? Yeah, and and, and that's what, what the book know. became. Yeah, or what you don't know exactly. Yeah, and that's what the book um, I feel like ultimately becomes um, in my own thinking right now. And so, how would you describe your book? Would you describe it as a memoir, as a journey, a story? How how, how do you describe it? Well, yeah, you know, I I just to say as a caveat that you know every time I or at least after my last book I set out to write a more <laughs> and a book that could be easily categorized um, and um, and in the initial conception of this book it was supposed to unfold simply as a journey and move from place to place and discover things and narrate it um, upon discovery. But when I really went on the journey um, that informed the book. Um, you know, I felt that that initial journey didn't really, you know, help me discover a lot of things or, mm -hmm. you know, um, there wasn't any big revelation at the end of the journey. So the question then became, how do I structure the book in such a way that the reader doesn't get frustrated by the dead ends and, you know, the incompleteness of the, of the journey or of the story. Mm -hmm. And so, the book, I think, in in a very broad sense, is a memoir because I'm writing about my life. I'm writing about my past, but it's also, as the subtitle says, a reckoning with history. So there's a lot of historical um, information that is included that doesn't necessarily have to do with my life personally. There's also, you know, really some commentary on on Nigerian politics, and really was an attempt for me to make sense of what I had discovered both in my journey and um, and also in the in the sense of what um, what the history of the war was, 
Um, and I think that's when you combine memoir and reportage and, you know, some kind of commentary, you, you get a sense of what the book is. Yeah. And, and, and to me, this is a cathartic human experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember when I lost my father and, or, and in the, the time was coming, he was winding down. Mm -hmm. He was constantly in the hospital. It became apparent that it was just a matter of time. And, and, and so I started sitting down with him and doing what I call the house cleaning, making mm -hmm. sure there was no bad blood between us, making sure that any, any things that we needed to resolve were cleared at the table. And, and, uh, I tried to collect from him as many ideas as he could, but he was starting to go into dementia. Um, but this is, a, you know, as a man, and I don't know what it's like to be a woman, so I'm not going to pretend to somebody can fill that in the blank mm -hmm. and the audience is a woman. But I, I think of a woman who loses their mother, it, it's a very impactful experience. Um, but for as a man, when you lose your father, you're, you, or, or you're both your parents, you become alone in the world. Mm -hmm. It becomes you. And up, mm -hmm. up until then, you're kind of, I don't know if coasting is the right word, but I, I mm -hmm. kind of always felt like I was like, well, you know what? he's still here so i'm gonna still be yeah. here and eh, yeah i'll deal with some things when uh you know maybe it, it, it's just me mm -hmm. and then suddenly you find yourself alone in the world yeah and you're like who am i and where am i going and like you mentioned it's not really about the destination because the destination is the journey mm -hmm. what you're learning and sometimes at the end of these cathartic journeys that we go on there is no right answer. There is no final thing where there's an epiphany moment where it's like, ta-da, here's the prize <laughs> the, yeah. at the end of the thing. You, yeah. you kind of reach a point where you have to come to some sort of cathartic reasoning or conclusion your end. Have I framed that correctly? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that you are very right that um, the nature of life or even thinking about life, whether mm -hmm. it's ours or that of others, is not... Um, it's not linear. It's I don't want to use the word messy, but it's certainly um, <laughs> mine was it's messy. Uh, <laughs> it's certainly um, you know um, it, you know it's it's certainly non-linear. Let's just use that word. Yeah. Um, and, mine's still and, messy. I'm still making yeah. a mess. <laughs> and and especially in relation to people who cannot speak back, right? This is the real thing in relation to that. That. Um, you know, uh, you know, the, the other thing that I've been thinking about is that the most honest form of conversation, I think I saw this in a poem, is with the dead is silence, right? Mm. Um, and so what happens, and this is why silence is in the subtitle of the book, what happens when the dead are keeping to themselves? Mm. Um, and I had to be clear that what I was making, um, making when I was, what I was doing in my writing was sort of, my own reasoning in relation to my father's life. I mm -hmm. didn't think that I was writing, even though I was as close to him as I was, I was writing anything authoritative about his person, about his travails. Part of the um, the most important thing to me, or the most cathartic thing, if I would use that word, or memorable thing at the end of writing, was that there was a lot that I didn't know, and that was fine. Um, you know, because I didn't want to present, and even for the reader, I hope that I've presented something that doesn't seem like it's too obsessed with knowing mm -hmm. as much as uh, the kind of conversation, for instance, that we are having is the point of the book, you know, to to have create this this frame where con conceptual or concepts of, around um, knowing, uh, around um, inheritance and all of that can can be, uh, you know, the reader and I can can have that conversation. There you go, and and I love that. I love how you uh, frame that because it's this is a journey I think most people go into when you're young and you're kind of immortal. You don't really care. You're living your life. You're you're chasing around, and then there's mm -hmm. kind of a moment where you start to slow down and go, wait, who the hell am I? And you start looking in that mirror harsher. So you grow up, you're born and raised in, in Nigeria, and then eventually yep. you come to New York. How does that transpire? And then <laughs> when do you make the decision to go back? Oh, yeah. Um, a very good question. I, 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 I went to university in Nigeria. I trained as a lawyer and then went to law school. Um, I mean, I went to law school in Nigeria, I mean. So 
right after university, which is a five year period in Nigeria, you go for a one year mandatory period if you want to become a lawyer. And so after that, you know, I'd sort of known almost early on in my in my in my undergraduate days that I, I wasn't sure I was going to practice law. It was it was a, a clarity I had for whatever reason. I had nothing to do with whether or not I was compelled to study law or any of that. I just felt that um, my interest, there was a greater interest in being a writer or figuring out what it meant to be a writer um, than, you know, say, practicing law. So once I finished law school, I had to figure out a way to make this work, right, career-wise, you know, money-wise and all that. And so I got involved with... um, an organization that would make road trips from Lagos in Nigeria to other parts of um, the African continent, which was the, in a sense, the basis of my previous book. Um, and after that, you know, when I was in one of those countries, I met someone who recommended that I, you know, go study in New York because he felt that what I was writing was art criticism and there was a program that could help me um sharpened that and so this was this was it i applied for the program at the school of visual art and got in and and just sort of stayed for the next seven years um you know or you know two years for the masters and five years afterwards just sort of making it work right in new york but uh, my when my father passed i i just became clear that it just became clear to me that around that time i had also got into a relationship that was also leading to marriage and I just felt you know what you know this is this is not a place I want to spend the rest of my life or you know start a family and so uh, Nigeria appealed to me for the fact that I was returning home I was returning to my family I was returning to start a family Mm -hmm. but also because you know and secondarily it was also the place where I felt I could tease out this um this interest such as the history of nigeria the history of the biafran war um and i didn't think that i could write a book like this if i wasn't if i hadn't recommitted to to living in nigeria full time mm-hmm. and this is an interesting journey going you mm-hmm. know i i should jumping back a little bit i i still often think about my father i think about his motivations i think about what he was trying to do what he's trying to think uh, i certainly i wrote the other day on facebook that I, I i i probably owe my father a few apologies and uh, a little bit more respect for mm-hmm. what he went through as i as i've as gone through my journey i'm going through his old age right now that he mm-hmm. was in when i had my largest interactions with him post childhood um and so you go back to nigeria and, and how do you go on this journey? Why do you choose your uncle? Um, I think it's kind of obvious, but I'd love to hear it from you. And, and, and how, what does this journey entail? I mean, certainly there's some complexity to it in mm-hmm. history. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I choose my uncle. Um, I should just reiterate if that wasn't clear. Like, my uncle is the person I was named after. You know, one of his names is my name, Emmanuel. His name was Emmanuel. I mean, this was, you know, I write it in more detail in the book. It was one of the names that he was known by, but became my first name. Um, and and so, you know, for me, because I had for many years been collecting, you know, books, buying books about a war, trying to research it just for, inter- in, you know, intellectual curiosity. And I sort of knew I would write a book or I wanted to write something about it. I wasn't sure what. Um, and it just occurred to me one day that, you know, the story that I'm trying to tell in relation to the war is in relation to my uncle. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the journey is, um, you know, I didn't have any, you know, uh, there, there's no place, I there's no archive where I could find his name or whatever. You know, it was really structured around talking to relatives, going to my hometown. Um, but also traveling to parts of um, Nigeria where the war had been fought. Mm-hmm. My idea was, you know, very, of course, very um, conceptual, very, um, uh, what's the word, very indirect was, you know, if I, if I could visit some of the places where the last battles of the war had been fought, 
since I had heard from my father that he was last seen in mm-hmm. the last year of the war. He was seen in the last year of the war. So I thought, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to look, think around or travel to places where the, the, the last battles of the war was fought. And just be there, right? It doesn't. I there was there was nobody that I was going to meet there that would immediately know my uncle. This is like a 50, 50 plus year period. Mm-hmm. But I also um, wanted to 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 understand how the war was being remembered or talked about in those places. So on one hand, I'm, t- I'm traveling to talk to my relatives or my father's friends, um, who 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 had been friends since who had been friends with him from childhood, but also in addition to that, I'm traveling to places that meant something in relation to the war, and bridging those you know bringing those two kinds of journeys together. So I travel to one place to meet a relative. I travel to another place to, um, you know, to just sort of talk to people or um, try to visit places that were important for the war effort. Let, let me ask you this. Did you hope to find maybe he might be alive? Maybe might he, <laughs> might, might he give you some insight? Or did you, were, were more you were interested in what you mentioned before, walking through his shoes and mm. experience? And just kind of trying to feel maybe what he felt or experienced or, or think maybe some of the things he thought. Um, well, I mean, I, I sort of was, I sort of knew that it would be almost impossible that he would still be, be alive. Mm-hmm. Right. So the fact, and which would have been a more dramatic story, of course, you know, yes. if I had sort of met him somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's because, you know, for two reasons, one, is that my father had always been, you know, made the statement over the years when he was alive that, oh, you know, what if one day he just returned, yeah. right? You know, which was, of course, a, a um, I mean, that's the, the that's that's what happens when people disappear, really, you know, because their bodies are not present. You just sort of keep imagining. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it was clear to me from my interaction with people who were old enough to have been, you know, alive during the war that um, people who went, regardless of how far people went back, part of what happened in the first year or within the first year, sometimes weeks, months, even a year or two, was that people find their way back to their hometowns, regardless mm-hmm. of how long it had taken. So for someone who who spent all that time, I mean, if he was alive and within, in his right mind, right, he would have certainly come back. Um, Also because, you know, part of what usually happened was that when the person didn't return after a bit of time, you know, a a symbolic burial would be held for the person, Mm -hmm. you know, in a, you know, because there were all these beliefs about the person's spirits that needed to be sent out properly and all that. And so, I don't think I, I think that by the middle of the journey or by actually pretty much early into the journey, it's it was clear to me that what I was doing was trying to understand what had happened to him. You know, really, that was the big question. What's what could have happened to this person and how could I fun, find that out? There you go. And the, the journey of going through it all and, and trying to walk in their footsteps. You know, it's interesting how we go through times in our life. And and I think this is what your book illustrates, where we we try and go home. And I've learned the hard way. You can mm. never really go home. Yeah. It's different. And, yeah. and you, but you you go like what I, I, I went back several times to my neighborhood as a child. And I walked the streets as I did as a child. And I tried to get a feel of of what that was and try to relive the experience a little bit or, or come to some sort of cathartic moment or see if there was something there. It was a journey of, of the experience. And there was a lot of similarities, but yet there is things a lot of different. And uh but but still it's interesting because you're going on an emotional or intellectual, I think it's both, a journey mm-hmm. within your own mind. You're trying to walk through people's experiences. And why did my parents choose what they did? Why did they, yeah. what shaped them? And, yeah. and thereby what shaped them also shaped me. Absolutely. Yeah. So very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, the idea that we could recover 
a sense of the past. It's always fascinating to us for many reasons. I mean, the present is usually has a degree of um, um, complexity, right? You know, dealing yeah. with everyday life. The future is sometimes, you know, aspirational and in, in, in also in some cases hard to imagine. But the past is always is settled in that sense so mm -hmm. if it's settled it's therefore in our minds recoverable or mm. we can recover part of it and so i think that there is always a fascination <laughs> for many writers i know you know to return into their childhood or the places yeah. that inform their childhood but the question is with what eyes are you returning um you know um as someone said the past um um the past must only be entered into illegally <laughs> you know it doesn't issue visas um so the question is you know what angle or with what um forged papers do we do we enter the past and 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 when you when you for instance go to the places or the streets where you grew up what you are seeing is what you're certainly seeing is through an adult's eye Mm -hmm. uh, how do you imagine yourself as a child with the language of an adult, right? That's the mm -hmm. that's the issue, right? That mm -hmm. we can't, you know, we can't quite uh, return to the language we had as children. We mm -hmm. are always sort of thinking about our childhood because um, we are now adults and using the language of adulthood to frame <laughs> what our childhood was, mm -hmm. and and so. Um, the only people that really know us as children are our parents. You know, that's the that's who, in the sense of even just the daily lives that we lived. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us, it's something to recover. For them, it's something they lived through um, with some degree of certainty. Yeah, and and correct me if I'm wrong here, but and I love what you're saying. Um, you know, this is also a journey. Uh, of a war of a nation that's uh, given freedom from the oppression of the United Kingdom's uh, colonization uh, of Nigeria in 1960, uh, where it gets it, it turns over. Uh, there's a coup. It's a it's a bloody horrific ethnic civil war that uh, has all the horrors of war, and, and in a way, your your uncle is taken from you and stolen from you by the events of this war. And it's it's almost kind of like the journey that we go on. You know, there's this the famous movie Citizen Kane, where at the end his final words are Rosebud, and everyone's like, "What is Rosebud?" And it was something that he lost, or something that was taken from him as a child. You you of course learn in the movie, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of that's kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of the journey of you're trying to find something that was taken from you and the history behind that and why it was taken from you and what happened with it and the journey of the history of a country and a people, which is also your identity as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because history, I mean, for me, the, the history had to become um, invariably um, personal in the sense that um, I was, I was not looking at this history to, or I wasn't writing about this history to simply just recount what happened. Um, mm -hmm. But as you say, what happened to me in relation to this history, Mm -hmm. I, I felt that this was the only way it mattered, really. Um, otherwise, I wasn't alive then. Um, one can only imagine what, what it meant for people who were alive then. And, you know, in fact, most people who are alive then have difficulties talking about it, you know, just because of how difficult it was, right? Mm -hmm. And how traumatic it, it is. And I think the idea that they need to say everything or deal with it. I don't necessarily agree. I mean, I feel like people can also deal with things by being quiet about it, you know, mm -hmm. um, but that's a different conversation. But I mean that uh, for me in writing this book, I, I, it was clear that the history had to be become personal. I had to engage with it in a way that m felt meaningful to me. And I think this is a great example and and why stories and authors and books like you that you've written, um, you know, they're life lessons. We don't get a life manual in this world. And so stories are the ways that we learn, mm. whether it's through film, books, TV, whatever it is, the stories, that's that's kind of our life lessons and manuals. And we learn from each other. 
you know, oh, you, you, you went through this, well, maybe I need to go on that journey or, or maybe this is similar to something I experienced. And it, it's, it's the human experience when it really comes down to it. You know, you, you're trying to find your way and you're, you're, it's a family experience. It's a, it's a personal experience. It's a, it's a father, mother, paternal, uh, maternal experience. It's a, it's a nation experience of, uh, it's a human experience that we we're going through and we're trying to find ourselves. Why are we here? What does this mean? What happens after what got me here? What was the motivations? And so I think that's the beauty of stories like this and, and why it's important that we, you know, try and find what this all means and, and it adds to the beauty of the of the breadth and tapestry of life um mm. and uh there's no really destination it's just it's all about the journey and maybe someday i don't know maybe someday before you die you come to the, some sort of conclusion to it all i don't know that anyone mm -hmm. does maybe maybe that's the point of it all that's the point of the afterlife <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the point of it all. You just, yeah. you experience it. it. It was really hard for me when I was young to, when people would say, it's about the journey, Chris, not the destination. I want to punch him in the face all the time. He used to make me <laughs> visceral. Um, but then I, but then I, uh, uh, you know, I got enough kicks in the ass from life. Um, uh, what, what more do you want to tease out of the book? Because we definitely want them to pick it up and read on it and go on the journey with you. Mm, mm. I mean, I um, what more do I want to tease out? That's a good. That's a good point. Um, or anything we haven't uh, touched on? Yeah, I think that part of what is important um, for me, or what was important for me in writing the book, was also to underscore how you know the historical is not far from the present moment. Um, um, and so, for instance, there were, um, you know the the war was fought between a country that or you know the the a region that declared itself independence called and called itself biafra with the nigerian federal government um and now you know at least since 99 in a more in a concerted way there's been at least there's been groups that um are advocating for you know for biafra again um um, and in the last, um, I would say, in the last seven years, it has gotten a little bit more um, intense with, um, with, with um, you know, a more militant group called uh, the, the indigenous people of Biafra. Mm -hmm. And in my writing this book, I, I knew that I wasn't writing a book about that movement for sure. You know, it would take more time and, you know, certainly more access that I didn't have. But I wanted to make the connection between how the war um, is talked about or not talked about with, you know, the fact that people feel emboldened to clamor for a return to, or, you know, the reinstatement or, you know, a, a, a fresh move into, um biafra um and you know but that the larger point was how do you how do you think how do you ensure that you don't think in pockets of events right so just think that something that happens in a country is isolated how do you make connections across um the history of a country um and for me that was very important to do you know yeah and you know you give me epiphany a lot of, not only from what we've talked about for a personal journey of personal identity, a lot of people are on this journey with their nations or their politics or whatever. Yeah. Nigeria, as you mentioned, is on this. Some people uh, have a romanticism to the past of certain things that maybe something was better back then. Uh, I've often found that, like I said, um, you can't go home. Uh, it's never, it's never wasn't as romantic yeah. as you thought it was, but there's sometimes that idealism, you know, um, your country, uh, Nigeria has been through civil wars, uh, and battles and fought, fought over identity and, and maybe a possibly return of the past, as you mentioned, uh, Africa as a continent, uh, has, you know, from colonialization and the removal of colonialization has been fighting for their identity and, and what they feel might be prevalent. Uh, our, my country, America, and your, your country too. Um, I, you know, we, we fought a civil war over our identity. We're still kind of fighting a civil war of that identity. January 6th, you know, there was the, there was the, uh, Confederate flag of losers 
in our capital, once again, in a fight for, you know, a clawback to what some people feel was a better time, which it wasn't. I lived there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I lived through some of that, some of that. Hey, we should go back to the old days. Eh, they weren't that great. Um, and, and they weren't great for everybody. And that's what we should have is a world that's great for everybody. But it's interesting to me, you give me epiphany that not only are people searching for that identity and, and reconciliation of who they are, um, uh, through the past is also a journey of nations. Yeah. I mean, it's so, you put it so brilliantly. Um, you know, the, I feel like, I mean, of course, historians, and this is the task of historians to sort of articulate a story that is not just the story of an individual, right? To think about it from a more collective perspective. But if we think about our lives, as I often do, as you know, as tributaries in a sea of stories, right? The question is that the fact is that we are, it's almost like a network of, of stories, right? So, um, the story of the individual within a family, within, you know, um, a country, or, you know, in my case, within an ethnic group, within a country, within, um, you know, and then gets bigger and bigger like that. Um, uh, you know, stories can be told on all those levels. And, and, and that is equally what I feel like of course, each country has to keep negotiating that. Mm -hmm. How do we tell a story? I mean, of course, for instance, in America, where um, um, some some stories are not being told, or some people feel that some stories are not being told, others feel like, oh, you know, you should include the story, right? Um, or stop telling the story. And it goes on and on with this negotiation of what should be told. Um, what is collective enough um, as a story, what is national enough as a story. Um, and I feel, you know, that as long as we keep looking for those big universal stories mm -hmm. um, that can represent every single person, we would keep having the same kind of issues that we're having, say, you know, in, you know, in most countries, really. Um, you know, because the, the story, and this is the final and the main point, that the story is inherently individual. Um, you know, it, we, we, of course, we latch onto collective stories to make sense of our individual stories, but we really always come down to it, you know, from an individual point. So, which is why uh, most people who participate in big political movements sort of you can you can tell a story of how their lives led to that moment or that participation mm -hmm. um and it didn't just it's not just this big story that you know the news would like to make it like oh this person did this mm -hmm. there is always the individual story in which um the bigger story plays or that is part of the bigger story so to speak yeah there you go you know it reminds me of something that william barr said uh, attorney william barr said that history is written by the winners and he may be quoting someone else but 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 that's not the true history that's the that's the winner's version of the history and they get to dictate it which was kind of his point in a very negative sense but it gives me thought that there's a there's a downside to that there's a negative side there's other stories there's other people's um experiences that mm. that can be highlighted that can be talked about it you know we just i just had the author of the uh the book the case for cancel culture on the show and we're talking about our culture that we have nowadays of victimhood and everything and i had an epiphany after the show that um you know sometimes it's not so much that uh, we need to be calling out or claiming that we're the victim of something mm -hmm. more so what it needs to be is that we're trying to tell our story that we're trying to tell uh, our experiences to each other so that we understand each other better so that we empathize with each other better you know you're you're educating me and i've learned a lot actually about the civil war uh, i've learned that doctors without borders came out of this I learned mm. that a lot of ngos came out of this that uh uh, I believe, you know, that TV guy you see it late at night and goes, one dollar will save children in Africa. Uh, a lot of these organizations came out of this, <laughs> this whole area. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lesson of when 
uh, colonization or powers removed and a nation falls into civil war. We did that in Iraq with the American government. We took it over. We had no idea that, yeah. that uh, you know, technically the thing that was keeping everybody in line was Saddam Hussein. And we removed him. The, to, uh, the, uh, the different or, uh, uh, ethnic groups went at each other. And so it's a lesson of history and life and stuff. But really, you know, we're, we're all trying to tell our story and make sure that people understand us. And the reason we're doing that isn't so much a narcissism as it is to where, you know, it's important that we learn from these stories and the experiences of others and that we understand each other and that we empathize with each other and we understand each other's journeys. Does that sound crazy or am I? No, to... no, that's that's very apt. <laughs> that's well put, actually. I'm on a yeah. journey today of uh, something. I'm going to learn. You know, I mean, the, the the first point you made about history being written by the winners, and um, which is, I mean, it's 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 it might sound cliched now, but it's so true. I mean, every cliche has a gem of truth, right? Mm -hmm. um, the it, one of the 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 ways in which that was sort of you know, made made um, apparent in in Nigeria's in the aftermath of the war was that you know there was this statement that was bandied around by the government, and I think it could be well meaning. You know, it's it was no victor, no vanquished, right? This mm -hmm. idea that everyone um, sort of in the spirit of reconciliation, no one should be considered a victor, no one should be considered um, vanquished, right? But um, I, I, when I'm thinking about it in retrospect now, I'm saying, oh yeah, that's of course what the winner would say. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. You know, the winner says, oh, no one was vanquished. Right. Uh, you know, the winner would say, um, I won. Therefore I make the rules on how the war is talked about. Right? Yeah. And, um, you know, in, in your country, in Nigeria, when it gained freedom from the United, United Kingdom, this is October 1st, 1960. It had a population of 45.2 million, and there were 300 differing ethnic groups and cultural groups, which is a lot to try and get everybody to all get along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so three yeah. of the largest ethnic groups, uh, you know, start, you know, warring battles with each other. You know, we, we have the same problem with, we're, we're going through the same problem now with the birth of America, where the winners of the, you know, of, of white, settlers who came here and enslaved and uh, attacked and destroyed many of the um, uh, Native Americans that were here and African Americans. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've been told kind of a whitewash story for 200, almost 50 years and, you know, of, of the winner's rule. And it wasn't always true. And we're finding out now that we're having these discussions and we're exposing stories. And, and I've learned a lot from great authors we've had on the show that have talked about other people's experiences that uh, weren't the winners in that thing. But in, in, in truth, it's not really about winners and losers. It's about hearing each other, understanding each other, and getting along as a community of, of human beings and making sure that everyone uh, at least is recognized as story is heard or is at least dealt with um, in, in a matter of empathy. Yeah. That, and we care. And so it's the, it's the, it's the constant battle for those stories and mm -hmm. finding out who we are, whether it's a person or a nation or a being or a group or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. Absolutely. Anything more you want to tease out of the book before we go? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I guess finally it's also, you know, I, I do, I do want to point out that for me also, and this finally actually, that writing this book was not just um, dealing with a tragedy. It was also to find uh, meaning for myself in a hopeful manner um, in relation to those tragedies. I, 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 I don't, I hope that I have not written a book that is suffused with um, self pity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, um, because the stories don't matter for the or the story that I write doesn't matter for its um, its scandalousness or its its sentimentality as much as for what it communicates about. I think, you know, the human condition and 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 attempts to an attempt to make meaning um, 
of the past, with the past, um, and, you know, through the past as well. Yeah. There you go. And, and an example to all of us, you know, I learned a long time ago, I, I didn't share stuff sometimes like when my dogs died and, and other things that were, um, you know, I, I had a lot of feeling or emotion in life. And I found that by sometimes sharing that stuff, I helped other people. Um, I remember when I shared the death of my dog with people that it was cathartic for other people. They were like, wow, I didn't realize you didn't have closure until you talked about the loss of your father, or the loss of your dogs and the experience that you went through. That to me, I didn't ever want to share because I felt like, oh, I'm just doing a pity party. Poor is me. Wah, wah, wah. And it was amazing to me how much talking about the experience of the human experience was uh, cathartic to other people and helped other people sometimes with closure and, and reconciling what they went through and stuff like that. And, you know, that whole journey of, of where we start to realize that we feel that we're alone in some things and we learn that we're not. Yeah. We're not. We're part of it kind of, it takes us on a journey where we feel like we're kind of wandering alone in the wilderness. And then we come back and, and arrive at a point where we find that we're part of the human race and this mm. is the human experience. And it's that yeah. coming b back and forth. Kind Absolutely. of an interesting way of doing it. Well, this has been really insightful. I've learned a lot, Emmanuel. I'm, in fact, I'm going to go you, Chris, spend yeah. some more time watching some videos on this war. I'm always interested in these these wars that shaped us and the history of it. And you know, the the one thing I always say on the show, the one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. That's why he's doomed <laughs> to repeat it. Yeah. So we should always learn. Uh, give us your dot com so people can find you on the internet. Um, my, my website is emmanueliduma.com and you can find a book really anywhere that books are sold, I, I think. There you go. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show and enlightening us today. You've lightened Thank you me. very much, Chris. Yeah. I, hopefully my audience, and if they're not lightened, well, then that's their problem. But uh, <laughs> I, I learned so much today. I hope um, they're enlightened, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, I don't know, go bask in my sexiness because my brain is so much bigger today. I've learned so much stuff. <laughs> but this is a journey we all go on. You know, I still think about my father to this day. Um and it was important that I, I did what you did. I went to find other people who could give me history. Because sometimes my father would give me a little bit of PR history. You know what I mean? Sometimes he, and and I think sometimes it wasn't an evil intent. So I think sometimes he was maybe trying to protect himself, but also maybe protect me from the yeah. truth a little bit. And so it's important to go learn about your history. You know, some people do this through genealogy, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, uh, order up the book, folks. Wherever fine books are sold, I am still with you. A reckoning with silence, inheritance, and history wherever fine books are sold. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Refer the show to your family or friends. Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, and LinkedIn, Fortress Chris Foss. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time. And that's